One pair of mints. Easy. We got it all. Welcome back to part two of the series that I'm doing on how to be an expat. Part two is about where. I'm going to go over a number of topics that probably amount to ten. How you choose where that you're going to go. The first thing is your information sources. You have to take them for what they are. Now there's a the biggest one out there because they've been around for quite a while and they make a ton of money selling seminars and various articles. They have vested interest. It's called international living. And many people really hate international living. I hate the result of what happens through international living, whereas people will read their articles, oh, you can live somewhere for two cents and live like a king, and they have all these crazy headings, which of course is to grab viewers and to build their audience. And I don't hate them for that. And as a matter of fact, I really don't hate them for the Pollyanna pictures that they paint of places. How is that for a bunch of peas? It's up to you to be more discriminating than just accepting it at face value. Of course, because they have a vested interest, they're going to try to paint every place that they do an article on as being this perfect utopia. You know, in Cuenca, when they write about that, they talk about the perfect spring-like weather. And then you see people there that live there wearing all these layers of clothing, heavy overcoats, and hats through half the year. And then you see a lot of gringos that come there to live complaining about how it's freezing. And practically every day you see, where can I buy a little space heater? So it's spring like Canada, sure, if you're from upper Saskatchewan, maybe. It's, you know, it's chilly there. So did they lie? No, but it is misleading. And so these articles are going to paint, and not just international living, but these articles have a vested interest in getting people there to buy into what they have to sell. Literally, they've got seminars they sell, three, four thousand dollars a pop. And they're not going to do that by giving you the bad news. So you can read them. They're entertaining. And the good things that they talk about are often pretty close to the truth. They're just leaving out the other side of the coin. So understand that. You can talk to friends who have been to various countries. You can um, YouTube videos like this one. But take them all with a grain of salt. What I say on my videos all the time it's my life, it's my experience. So your experience may be different than mine. It's just one more piece of information you can put in the pot. You can also visit. But if you visit, visit with a purpose. Don't go and just, oh yeah, it's, I verify that it's perfect. Go there to verify particular things. Walk neighborhoods. Talk to local people. If you don't have any Spanish, invest for a day or two for a translator to go with you. I mean, what's it going to cost? 40 bucks maybe? So that you can actually quiz people on certain things. But go prepared. Go with a list of important things to you for questions about neighborhoods to live in. You know, cost of living people are obsessed on. I'll cover that in a minute. But go there prepared to do your homework. It, it isn't vacation time. This time is to go and do fact finding, to verify things that you've read or to find out if there's another side to it. Second thing to consider when you're trying to find where you want to go live is the language. Now, obviously viewers of my video are primarily interested in South America, Ecuador, Colombia, those are the hot spots. And having lived in both, I can co concur, those are good choices. However, Spanish is an obstacle. You're not going to go to a place, even in Cuenca, and be comfortable living unless you learn at least the bare minimum of Spanish. 
Now everyone seems to intend to learn some Spanish before they come, but somehow when they got here, they never seem to have gotten around to it. It's because it's difficult. It really is not easy. And so when you're considering living in a place outside of your particular language, give it a lot of credence. Most people just kind of poo-poo it away. Well, there's other people that do fine. Well, you're not other people and you don't know their particular circumstances. You don't know their situation. And so don't assume that you're going to do fine. It can be really problematic going in an emergency to a doctor and not being able to relay information. There, there's just so many things where it can literally be life and death. And do you want to put yourself in that situation? So definitely consider language. Third thing is the stability. The stability of the government is a big one. How long has it been stable? Now I'm going to compare Ecuador to Colombia here. Colombia has been a very long-running republic. Ecuador, on the other hand, through its history, has struggled all over the place with military coups and assassinations and dabbling in socialism. It, it just can't seem to get its feet on the ground. So what difference does it make? It, it's, it's been pretty stable there for the past 10-15 years. Colombia had a lot of turmoil going on, so does that really matter? Well, it does really matter because it takes that stability is what saved Colombia and brought it to where it is today because there was always something that they could hold on to. Where in Ecuador, they don't have that firm foundation. They're still alive and well, the culture of corruption and uh, the old drug trade and there, there's just a lot of those things going on so you definitely want to consider stability it's problematic to go to a country and have the laws constantly changed or interpreted in different ways that usually work against you related to that visa rules again I'll do a quick comparison of Ecuador and, and Colombia to get a visa in Ecuador, I had a difficult time. I arrived in Ecuador with every single document posted on the internet and talked to an attorney, every single document, certified, apostille, yet when I got there, uh, the process should have just been a matter of weeks. It took seven months. And through the course of it, they kept requiring that I get more documentation. My original visa expired. I had to go to Peru, get an extended visa, come back. That was, you know, $500 on a trip wasted. I had to go through all those things. And ultimately, when it came down to it, my original documentation is all they ever really needed. Now, why is that? It's because in Ecuador, it depends on what office you go to and who you speak to in that office and the mood they're in that day. Because the law can be one thing, but it's pretty much what they decide it's going to be on that given day. And so if he wanted to require of me to get XYZ, I'm not going to get my visa unless I go get XYZ. I went and got it, didn't go into the package. As a matter of fact, they handed it back to me. Well, that's great. Each one cost me between $350 and $500, and I had three different documents. Another almost $1,500 completely wasted, seven months of my time wasted, a lot of frustration. So that goes to the stability. It goes to the foundation. How long has it been stable? Is it a cronyism type of thing? So if you're friends or family, you get one level of service, but if you're an outsider, then you get a whole different and not as good level of service. You want to consider that. Years ago, Colombia had a lot of similarities to that. Today, it's completely different. The law is the law. It's all you need. Everything is boom, boom, boom. I had from start to finish, I had my visa in 10 days. Um, actually, I think it was more like uh, six or seven days. I think I had my cedula in 10 days. Not to include having to um, 
replace my lost passport. That wasn't Columbia's fault, that was my fault. But once I got that passport, it was just so rapid fire. Uh, the cost was under $500. It was just simple, easy, very little documentation. So those are things to consider. I'm not here selling Colombia. I love Colombia. I love my time in Ecuador. But you got to face reality and you can't just wish it away because you want to live in that fantasy that really doesn't exist anywhere. Safety. Oh my God, this one drives me crazy. You'll see all the time on the, on the forums and Facebook about how perfectly safe a place is because I never had a problem. Well, you, you never had a problem until you have a problem. That has nothing to do with how comparatively safe somewhere is. In Ecuador, one of the things you have to consider is you have these wonderful stats about the low level of crime. On the other hand, there is a very high rate of the lack of reporting of crime. If you don't report a crime, it won't show up in the stats. That's a big problem in Ecuador for a whole series of reasons. A lot of it is just cultural. Uh, sometimes it's fear of retaliation, but it's, it's a, certainly a problem so that when you look at the stats and you say the stats are so wonderful, I'm going to go by that because they're in print must be true. It was done by international organizations such and such. Yeah, not necessarily. I would like to give you a comparison, but I, I can't dig back in my memory to be clear enough. But there, there was one instance where in Cuenca, uh, one year, I think it was, it might have been 2015 or 2016, there were two murders and then shortly after those two murders in, in Cuenca, there were three murders that were gangland style, uh, drug related, uh, a taxi cab driver who was involved, two of his passengers, somebody walked up uh, right down in El Centro and boom, 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 shot them all. Yeah, well, they're not supposed to have guns. Well, the criminals have guns. And so here in this very short span of time were five murders. And then I saw an article talking about how there was one murder in Cuenca. Well, there were five. So, all I'm saying is you can't necessarily just believe that. Well, if you can't believe that, then what can you believe? How do you know if it's safe or not? Honestly, you don't really know. What you have to do is use precautions. You have to be careful about what you carry, what kind of jewelry, what kind of uh, impression you're putting out there. Are you trying to walk around wearing Hugo Boss and the best of everything? Or do you just look casual? Do you carry a lot of cash money on you? Or do you carry just what you need? You need to use some caution. And I'll say that pretty much about any place assume that there's high crime and be pleasantly surprised when you never see it because even at the highest crime rates the most people are not personally affected by crime even in Chicago where it's one of the murder capitals of the world the majority of the population there is unaffected by it which is why it just continues so safety is a really hard thing to wrap your hand around. Once you live in a place for a while, you start to get a more accurate sense of what's going on, what places are more dangerous. In Cuenca, for example, there's five zones that are relatively unsafe. It's real simple. Don't go to those zones. Don't go to Fiera Libre later in the afternoon because there's a lot of criminals that live in that area, for example. Don't hang around the bus terminal at night because there's a lot of crime that goes on in that area. So, I mean, just use common sense like you would if you were in any, any big city. If you're living in the country, it can be a little more problematic because you can become a target. So just be careful of that. But don't assume if you've got 50 people on a forum telling you how perfectly safe a place is that that's really the truth. It just means they don't have any experience with any of the crime going on.
many of those people don't speak the language, therefore don't really have much of any local friends, therefore they're not in the pipeline of finding out what's really going on in a community. So you just, you just can't take that as being meaningful information. But it is something to consider and be cautious about and ask questions about. Mobility inside the country and outside the country. How easy or problematic is it to catch a flight and go back to see your grandkids? What kind of access do you have to airports? Are the airlines reliable? Those can be important things. And then also inside the country, how easy does it get from place to place? How is the taxi system? How's the bus system? How problematic is it to use those? Do you want to buy a car? What's going to be required for you to buy a car and to get a driver's license? How difficult is that? If most expats don't have a car, there's probably a reason why they don't have a car. So you want to look into those things. You definitely want to make sure that you're in a situation where your particular needs are met by the mobility factors that exist in that country. Cost of living. <laughs> oh, my favorite topic. Cost of living. It, you know, it's how long is the piece of string that's in my pocket? Well, you can't answer me, right? Because you have no idea of the circumstances around that. The cost of living depends on so many things. How do you live? What kind of lifestyle are you expecting? If you think that you're going to go to pretty much any country down here and live like a king for $1,500 a month, you're crazy. You're not, you're not going to find it. It doesn't exist. I don't care what the headlines are. It doesn't mean you can't live, and it doesn't even mean that you can't live well. But you're certainly not going to have hot and cold running maids running in and out of your apartment, and a driver, and a limousine. I mean, you're not going to live like a king. Personal security, all the things that in your fantasy world you're, you're maybe thinking because of headlines, uh-uh, it's not going to happen. Doesn't mean you can't have a nice place to live in a nice area go to nice restaurants once in a while, you can live a nice life. But cost of living is so problematic because it, it depends so much how you choose to live. Now when I first went to Cuenca, to reveal something a little personal, when I first went to Cuenca, I had quite an online income coming in and I was living on about $4,000 a month. Now I knew that wouldn't sustain itself, but in that first year, aside from trying to get healthy again, I did a lot of traveling. I went to, I went all over Ecuador and I spent a lot of money trying out different restaurants, expensive restaurants. You know, if you go to Noah Sushi in Cuenca or Red Crab, it's very easy to drop over a hundred dollars on you and a guest. I wasted a lot of money, but in that lifestyle, living the way that I was living, I needed all that, right? I scaled down over time to where I could live on $1,500 a month and live a pretty good life. Now, I couldn't do the things I was doing before, obviously. But I also became more wise to the ways. And I was helped along the way by one local friend in particular, but by some others, to learn how to buy certain things, how not to waste money. You can get the same thing for half the money if you go to such and such or if you do it a certain way. So your cost of living when you initially get there is going to be higher than it will be as you're assimilated into the culture. Also cost of living is very deceiving uh, when people post it up. Very often this information is coming from those same people that have vested interest in getting you there. And when you go to forums and you ask the question, you're going to get answers all over the board because you're going to have people that live in a lot of different ways. You have people that get on there and say, I can live for five or six hundred dollars a month and live great. But then when you dig into it, you find out, well, rent didn't really count because of a situation they had. And, and you find out that it's not really true. Or in one case, there was this lady that was telling me how she lived on just over $400 a month 
but as we continued to talk over the course of a number of weeks, she was living in abject poverty. She was not living in Cuenca. She was living on a small farm and virtually had nothing. No um, electric part of the week. Uh, she did have internet when electric was on, it worked. But she had virtually nothing in her life. And if she's happy with that, that's great. But that's not what most people are looking for. And that's usually not long-term sustainable. People that live in that kind of situation generally strive to get out of that situation. So, also there's another misconception, and you have to be aware of this. And in Ecuador, you hear this all the time. The people here live on the minimum of $400 a month. It's simply not true. It's simply bogus. That stat is a government established dollar amount that they use to calculate various benefits. You may find occasionally somebody who actually lives on $400 a month. And again, they're living in the family home. They've got a support system around them, other people in the family that are making money that help them along. So it doesn't really count. You can't go by that. Most people in Ecuador make more and considerably more than that. So it's simply a bogus stat. Well, if they live on 400, I should be able to live on 800. Except they're not really living on 400. Except with extenuating circumstances, with, guess what? You don't have, most likely. You probably don't have the family home to live in. You probably don't have other relatives there that are going to chip in when you lose your cell phone and you have to get a new one. So that's just wrong information. You can't take a government established minimum and say that's what the norm is. Well, even if that number were accurate, it's still not the norm, it's simply a baseline, and that means most is above it, right? You have a strong, healthy middle class, uh, particularly in Cuenca, Ecuador. Now in Colombia, you have a fair amount of poverty, but unemployment here runs around 10% versus the over 50% when I lived here 16, 17 years ago. It's continued to improve. So you can walk to certain areas that you still see a lot of poverty. Uh, one thing is they don't hide it here in Cuenca. They, they kind of run them off. Um, they only allow certain beggars to beg. They actually have to be permitted. But in Colombia, it's really kind of a free and open society and people can do whatever they want. And if they want to exhibit their poverty, they can exhibit their poverty. But it's hard to find people here in Armenia that don't actually have a job. They're actually working. They're not living in that abject poverty. So it's getting to know, getting to understanding your surroundings. One thing that's considered poverty by a lot of people that come from North America is they'll look at a housing area, a barrio, a neighborhood, and they'll look and say, oh my God, they're so poor, and they don't understand that they live in a different way and what you're considering poor could be middle class it's just they they live in smaller places they live with small rooms that's it's traditional now you're seeing places are getting bigger and bigger uh, my apartment to me is really really small but here it's considered to be big my friends come and the first time they see my two bedroom two bathroom apartment they go Oh my God, it's just you, this place is so big. Well, it's not, but it's all a matter of perspective and it's cultural to be a certain way. It doesn't mean it's poverty. And so, you know, before you make those value judgments, you want to get to know really what's going on. So cost of living is really a hard thing to wrap your hand around. But once you find out you're comfortable with whatever that number is, make sure you pad it for issues that come up when you first move. There's going to be extra expenses. You've got the learning curve before you break into what it ultimately will be for the you know, following years. So you, you, if you think that the cost of living in a place is going to be $1,200 a month, 
You better make that 2000 for a while. Factor that in. Think of opening a new business. You know, you always open with more money because things happen, you know, for that period of time. If you don't have it, then don't make the move. Step back, plan some more, or figure something else out. You're, you're managing to survive where you are, then stay where you are. You need to have that cushion, I'm telling you, or you put yourself in a serious situation. Okay, I think I'm up to number seven, healthcare. It's something that you don't want to ignore. It became a habit in the United States for a lot of people to ignore it because it's expensive and you can use that money for something else. After all, you're pretty healthy. But if you're gonna be in a place long term and you don't have any kind of safety net, you can't just walk into a hospital and get service because it's required by law, which you get in the United States, you, you better have yourself a safety net. So the things that you wanna consider, the cost, of course, you know, what's it gonna cost you to have a reasonable policy. Second, the availability. Now, when I say availability, aside from the obvious, I also mean if you get sick and you need an appointment, is that appointment going to be available to you? One of the issues that I have with the uh, Social Security system in Ecuador is that my very good friend Maria, her mother, has diabetes and she gets sick occasionally. One time she got very, very sick. By the time she got her actual appointment, after several reschedules and problems around bureaucratic issues, it was seven months later. After that seven months, other complications developed and she ended up considerably sicker than had she gotten the appointment to begin with and got taken care of. So availability can mean more than just can you get a policy. The, now, the Social Security system in Cuenca, if you ask people, you're going to get a whole mixture. You're going to get people that say, oh, I've been there four or five times and I had a stellar situation. It was wonderful. It was perfect. And that's great. And I, I believe, just like with crime, I believe that most people probably have a similar experience. Except a fair number of people don't, who also have horror stories to tell about the hellish misery they went through and there's a lot of those stories out there and so that, that should give you pause so you know private insurance it gets to be kind of expensive so it's going to be a little more problematic to really nail down what will work for you now in Colombia it's real simple it's $37 a month you get full coverage and your appointments are within a day or two it, it's it's a much easier simpler system also, you want to consider in Ecuador, they run in the red. They run in the whole $4 billion plus every year that has to be found somewhere in the government budget. The government budget is not like the United States budget. You know, if you've got a budget of $50 billion, $4 billion is pretty serious. So, you know, it's essentially running bankrupt constantly. And so that's, you know, that's problematic. Will it be there for you in four years, five years? I, I don't know. In Colombia, they run in the black. In other words, they run at a profit. It's a private system. So it's cheap, it's dependable, it's reliable, and some of the best hospitals in this hemisphere are located right here in Colombia. Uh, none in Ecuador on that international list. Now, do I be believe that best 50 hospitals is gospel? No, I don't. I don't take anything at face value, but it's one bit of information to consider. Taxes, are they gonna tax your social security income? Uh, do they have a lot of import taxes that will affect your life and your cost of living as you go on? Uh, when you do replace that lost cell phone, whether it was stolen where there's no crime? You wanna consider the portability of your money now, again, in Ecuador, they uh, passed this law that said that anything over approximately $1,000 and you had to pay a 10% escalating tax to remove it from Ecuador. So if you decide you don't want to live there anymore and you put $25,000 in the bank, you're going to give a good chunk of that to the Ecuadorian government. Now, I just read that they, they 
are going to or they have repealed that. Well, that's a wonderful thing. It was hurting their tourism business, as you can imagine, particularly since it was such a low amount. Other countries, you want to look at that consideration. In Colombia, you want to look at that. Now, do they tax my income? No, they don't. Uh, there's a rumor here that your income is taxed. It's taxed, but only under certain circumstances. If you've got a very high income, if you, it's primarily if you're earning money in Colombia or you have a business in Colombia, then of course your money is going to be subject to tax. But if you have retirement funds coming from outside the Columbia and you're simply collecting it uh, at the ATM or whatever, however you do that, that's not subject to any income tax. Now, take my word for it, no. What you want to do is go to the source. You want to uh, talk to a tax attorney in Columbia so that you know your particular circumstance doesn't have some provision that would be different. I can tell you, I do not have a tax issue. I know a number of gringos down here that are living on retirement funds and not a single one of them has a tax issue. Does that mean no one does? No, it doesn't mean that. So consider your situation, protect yourself, get accurate information. I can tell you to visit with even over the internet or by Skype an attorney in Colombia or in Ecuador, it's not going to be that expensive. I mean, you might drop 20 bucks or something, but it's, it's worth it, right? So find out firsthand. Last thing, the weather. The weather's important. Um, we all want to live in a place where it's comfortable. So you want to consider that, but what is comfort to you? I mean, you think living on the beach is comfortable, but you know, if you're in a beach that's got mosquitoes eating you alive, if it's so hot that you really can't go out until it's nighttime, it, it, you want to consider that no matter where it is in the world that you want to go. If you're in the mountains, that's all well and good, but you do realize you're going to get a lot more rain. Rain is nice, so what, you know, what's the weather pattern really like? And if you go for a week, you don't really know because that week doesn't mean what it is normally. We just went through a period where we had a hot spell I'd never seen before and they actually broke some records and we we're getting a lot of rain uh, during the day. That's not really common here. And now we're back, we're in the period where it's mostly in the 70s and it rains almost every day, but it rains at night. So at night, two o'clock in the morning, you hear a little thunder and lightning and the rain, and to me it's soothing. You wake up in the morning, the sun's out, and it's good to go, and everything's refreshed, and it's why everything's green. So, weather's important, but what is it to you? And what you don't want to do is believe these internet um, articles, magazines, or defenders that will tell you how weather is always perfect because I mean maybe it's perfect for them doesn't mean it's perfect for you. They say oh you don't need heating or air conditioning in Cuenca except there's a lot of people that buy heaters. A lot of people, a lot of people buy heaters. So why is that? You don't have to because you're not going to die because it's 20 below zero but that doesn't mean that it, for many people it's not very uncomfortable. So you know weather is a personal thing and you can't get that from International Living or any other article on the internet, you really have to kind of dig deeper into it. You can look at weather, weather stats historically through the Weather Channel, so you can take a look and see fact-based information on the year 2015, what was the weather pattern, the temperatures, 2016, 2017. You definitely want to do that type. Both in Ecuador and in Colombia, if you so choose, you can find the perfect weather that suits you. So that's a real plus. Where I am here in Armenia, it's, it's warmer than Cuenca. It's considerably warmer. It's primarily in the mid to upper 70s with occasional bouts into the low 80s. At night, it might drop down and might get into the 60s. That's the weather here year round. Now, because my elevation isn't so high, I'm only around 5,000 feet, do I see an occasional mosquito? I've seen one. 
I've been here in Armenia now for four months, maybe. I've seen one mosquito because there's always a breeze. It's just not a mosquito area, even with all the rain. As many of you longtime viewers know, that's a big criteria for me. So, you know, it suits my taste to a T. Now, if I wanted it cooler when I was in Manizales, it's cooler there. But then again, it's over 7,000 feet. It's getting close to what it is in Cuenca. So you can find what you want. Both. These are things that you need to seriously spend time on. I was sick. I was stuck in bed. And when I decided that I wasn't going to die, um, I was pronounced to die. But personally, I felt I really wasn't going to die. And so after I'm not sick anymore, where do I want to go live? And I've covered this before as to why that was the case. So I had about a year to investigate. And even with all that time and with all the digging and people that I talked to, there were still surprises. There were still things that I didn't know. But I had narrowed it down to where surprises that came up, they were certainly manageable. The biggest one, because I quickly focused on Ecuador, was because I didn't check more into Colombia to see that it was nothing like when I lived there before. And so that was a big error. I should have dug deeper into that. But I eliminated the Philippines. I'd lived there before, but it's just way too hot, way too often. Don't like it. Thailand, beautiful place. I've been there, loved it. Um, on the other hand, it has such a stigma around it. I just didn't want to... Uh, uh, I didn't want to be saddled with that stigma. Beautiful, beautiful place though. Japan, lived there three years. Absolutely loved it. One of my favorite places on the planet. Simply can't afford to live there. If I'm not working a full-time job, yeah, I just can't afford it. So, I mean, I considered places in Europe. There's so much going on there. There's so much turmoil. I just don't want any part of that. I've traveled to places all around this globe and I really like South America, and I really like Colombia, probably my first or second favorite place in the world uh, after the United States, which I still believe is the best place on the planet. Ecuador, I thought, would be similar, and it wasn't. But in a way, there were some pleasant surprises. There's some charms about Ecuador. It's certainly a place to consider. So. Where is important, obviously, because that's where you're going to be residing. Take your time. Do your homework. Having said that, I want to thank you for watching this. Be, there's quite a few more in this series. They'll be coming out a couple a week. Uh, please consider contributing to support this channel, Patreon. If every subscriber threw a couple dollars a month in there, then it would resolve all my problems, and I could probably even get an editor to help me with this. Ah, it's a dream. It's a fantasy, right? Keep making your comments, like, subscribe. I appreciate all of that, and I'll see you the next time.